we have a lot to cover, so get some oxygen right now because we're going fast. Is everybody with me? Yeah. All right, let's be. We're going to wake up big, 8 o'clock. Here we go. So we are wired for stories. I don't know if you realize that, but that is an absolute truth of our life. Two-thirds of the Bible is narrative. Two-thirds of the Bible is storytelling, and we see it throughout Scripture. As a matter of fact, Jesus, and that's what we're going to see in this series, is a master storyteller. He is going to get to something in telling stories that most people struggle to get to theologically through all of the, like I could probably preach for 10 years and not hit some of the stuff Jesus does in a single story. He's that good. And the cool thing is we love stories. And listen, I was just at the men's retreat and we couldn't have a, you know, a fire out there because it was raining pretty much from the time we arrived to the time we left. But I'm going to tell you, all it took for stories to start was for a group of dudes to sit in a circle. That was it. That was all that was required. If you want to see how ingrained in us it is, get your children, put them around a campfire. They will want to do two things. Eat s'mores, tell stories. That's what they're going to do. It's wired into us. And in this series, we're looking at a parable. If you don't know what a parable is, that is really just kind of a, a, a theology word or a storytelling word. It just means a story with a point for your life. That's really all that is, is a story with a point for your life. And in Luke chapter 15, Jesus is going to tell us really one story with three very weird kind of separated parts. But they're all about the same thing. They're all about lostness. In the first story, he's going to give us this interesting ratio because he's going to talk about sheep. And he's going to say, one out of a hundred sheep something happens to, and this is how valuable that one sheep is. And then the next story, he's going to move from one to a hundred. He's going to go to one out of ten. And he's going to talk about coins. And he's going to go, here's the value of the one coin. And then in the third story, he is going to deliver this knockout blow that you are going to get heavy before this series is over. Where he's going to go, he went one out of a hundred, one out of ten, and then he's going to get to one out of two. And he is going to deliver a punch. And he's not going to talk about sheep or coins. He's going to talk about a person. And he's going to declare value that is incredible. Now next week, we're going to talk heavy, heavy, heavy about the group of people that Jesus is telling this story to. But for the sake of this morning and setting up the parable, let me give you a quick glimpse at the crowd that is gathering around Jesus as he prepares to teach. You have really two groups, but it's, it's, it's actually broke down into four sections of people. And if you're a, a note taker, this is a good time to take some notes. So you have the tax collectors. Uh, and let me give you the best understanding of the tax collector. In their, his, historically, in their time, they were referred to as the collaborators. What, they, what that meant was, um, it, it would be like this. If you can imagine um, when, when the Nazis in, uh, began to torture the Jewish people, there was a small group of Jewish people who actually collaborated with the Germans, not because they liked the Germans, but out of their own fear for their life, they collaborated with the enemy to hurt their own people. Now, how do you think their people felt about them? Not real good. That's the tax collectors. They have aligned with Rome against their own people. They have collaborated with the enemy. That's who the tax collectors are. And then there's what they call the sinners. Now, we hear sinners, we just think people who do bad things. Um, that's all of us, right? We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Anybody with me? Yeah. All right, no. But this is actually a different word. It, it's, it's what they were, it's the excluded or the disqualified. You'll hear more about that in just a second. But these are people who have literally been already in their life excluded from the kingdom of God. Now, you might go, how does that work? Well, it... Um, that's, that's bad theology. That was just a, a practice of their day, okay? And because you had this other group that was made up of two other subsections. The first one was the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, I don't want to get too deep into kind of the Bible study part of this. The Pharisees were the people who resist what's called the Hellenization uh, of, of, the, of their world, of, of, of Israel, which means they, they were trying to avoid Greek influences coming in. They didn't want to learn a Greek language. They, want to, they didn't want to, to learn Greek uh, traditions and any kind of stuff like that. They kind of wanted to build a wall around their people, keep God inside and everybody else out. That was the Pharisees. And then there was the teachers of the law. Now you might go, well, that sounds nice. Teachers, that's, they're just teaching the Bible. No, no, no. They actually had the legal right. They served a legal purpose in this culture. They were the ones who had the right to look at someone's life and go, Steve, uh, 
you're excluded from the kingdom of God. And that legal decision was made by those people, and you're out. So that's the group that's gathered. One that doesn't look real good, and the other one that might look worse. And these are the people that are pulled around Jesus. And it's in this context, and you're going to hear a lot more about that next week. That's the context that Jesus decides to unpack three stories. And these three stories may be, uh, and, and Jesus, every time he teaches, it is beautiful and golden. This may be one of the places where we can see the deepest. Amen. And so I want you to just listen to the story. Okay? So here we go. Story number one. Pam? So he told them this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who don't need repentance. So you have a hundred sheep. Now, let me give you a first indication that whoever owns these, this is a wealthy person. But you, they, didn't, they didn't become wealthy by accident. And so the question is, do you leave the 99 to go after the one? And in our world, we'd go, it's just one sheep and you got 99, don't go after it. We need to understand that this is not a thing where he's saying, go after something that's worthless. In their culture, one sheep, the declared value for that sheep was off the charts. As a matter of fact, if Mark went and stole one of my sheep, and, and maybe he did something to it, he killed it, and I took him to court, do you know, in their culture, he's not tried for the value of one sheep. He is tried for the value of that sheep, and he is also tried for the value of any other sheep and any other product that every, any other sheep from that offspring might produce. It is a massive amount of money. That he's now on the hook for. Probably not going to be paid back in his lifetime. And so what would more than likely happen to him is he'd be in prison forever or killed. That's the value of the one sheep. They, it is not just the value that's there. It's their, man, this is so good. It's their potential value. And so that's why he goes off to find it. And then when he finds it, he parties. And this, so here's what Jesus is doing. He is reinterpreting for them an Old Testament God that they've misunderstood. So they've seen God as the one who went, we got 99 and that one's wandering. Yeah. And he's going, no, no, no. You misunderstand my father. I know the will of my father. Let me tell you what my father's really like. And so he's going to reinterpret God correctly for them because what we do with God and what they do with God, we do it still today, is we tend to take our broken nature and we go, well, if I think this way and I feel this way, then God probably thinks this way and God probably feels that way. And I got to tell you, your brokenness never applies to God's character. Amen. It's not a thing that happens. And so Jesus is saying, no, 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 this is my God. And so let me give you a hint in scripture. Anytime Jesus says the kingdom of God is like, or when Jesus says, I tell you, at any point in the story, what he's saying is, I'm about to tell you the main point of the story. And so what he says right here, you heard Pam read it. He says, I tell you, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner, over one disqualified, over one collaborator, than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, here's, here's a hard truth. Are we ready for a hard truth this morning? Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need everybody in on this, or I'm not sure I can go there, okay? Are we ready for a hard truth this morning? Amen. Yeah, you're a sheep. I'm a sheep. But he didn't tell the parable of the hundred dolphins. They're smart. Okay? They got better SAT scores than you, okay? He told the story of a hundred sheep. You know why? Sheep are dumb. Now, some, we have two categories of people right now that are going, uh, listen, uh, I know I'm a sheep. And I honestly feel like God struggles to love sheep. You're wrong. And the other person, we got other groups of people in here, they go, I ain't no sheep. I'm better than sheep. <laughs> You're wrong too. <laughs> Those both of them are wrong. So here's the deal. Let me tell you why I think, I think he talks about sheep. I don't know if you have an experience with sheep. Believe it or not, I actually do. So my grandpa had a farm all my life growing up. We had chickens, goats, horses, cows. And we had sheep. 
And, and I hated our sheep um, because they're dumb. We constantly have to get them out of problems that they were constantly doing. I remember one time my cousin showed up and he brought his girlfriend and she had never seen a sheep. We were talking, listen, they are, they're really kind of very gentle animals, but they're very uh, annoyingly persistent if you've ever been around them. And so um, so his girlfriend's like, oh, they look so cute. We're like, oh, you can go pet them. They're totally chill. Uh, and we're like, if you want to keep them really calm, here's this bundle of alfalfa. Just walk out into the field with that and it'll keep them really calm. If you don't know anything about sheep, that's their food. They are the opposite of calm when they sense alfalfa is coming. And so she grabs this bundle of stuff. She walks out there immediately. Every sheep within like 100 yards is full on running at her. And in her mind, she just started running from the sheep. So she's running all over the field. She's, but she did the one thing where like, I can't believe this happened. She never dropped the alfalfa. So they're just chasing her all over. So we had to run out of the field. We're like, drop, it's the food, drop the food. And then they dropped and she was able to run off and they all tried to fight for the food. And then later that day, my cousin was single. It was really kind of cool. Um, and so <laughs> the thing is, you might go, how does a sheep get lost? Well, Jesus is going to use a huge, like this, the economy of Jesus' words is amazing. A hundred sheep is a big herd. And listen, animals herd for several reasons. The number one reason is safety. If you're ever watching National Geographic and you find the one antelope that wanders off for the herd, there's a scientific word for that animal. I don't, do you know what it is? Brunch. That's what that animal is. He is the one that's going to get picked off because he... Wandered off. But how, why would a she? Why would they leave the safety? Why would they leave comfort and wander off? I'll tell you why. Having watched sheep, because they just keep eating, and when they eat, they put their head down, and they put their eyes down, and they follow their stomach instead of following the safety. It's not a horrible sheep. He's not a sheep who's embezzling money from the other sheep. He, he's not cheating on his sheep wife. He's nibbling himself away from God by following his stomach. You know, we, we do the same thing. We, we sit there and pursue something, and then we end up in our place where we go, man, I feel miserable and bloated because I've had too much of this thing. I've been following my own desires and my own appetites for so long that I've found up in a place where I feel alone and miserable. That happens to it. Now, listen, don't misunderstand me. You can follow your stomach in the path of sin, and that's always going to lead you to a bad place. But do you know, I think we can all acknowledge, sometimes we can put our head down and we can start following a desire that isn't necessarily inherently evil, but if you don't pick your head up and recalibrate, it goes bad. Like, we're about to come into Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I'm going to tell you, you, I will never be the preacher that preaches against eating fudge and pumpkin pie. That's going to happen, man. Like, you, I, pray, I pray you do that. The Bible is this great rhythm of feast and famine and feast and famine. There's a time for celebrating and rejoicing. But the danger is, no matter what you pursue, whether it's working out, whether it's financial stuff, is you've got to make sure you don't keep your head down in the pursuit of that thing. You've got to lift your eyes up and recalibrate to the Father. That's what's happening in this story is the sheep is not recalibrating. Listen, we get lost by two things no normally. One is distraction. We wander off from God and, and honestly, we didn't even realize we were wandering. And the other way we get lost is denial. It's where we recognize that we're creating distance from God and from, and, and, and from God, but we refuse to see where we're going is wrong. Listen, church, I, in our church, if you've been here for any length of time, you know we are going to be heavy-handed with the love and grace of God. Amen. But we can never be light-handed with the truth of God either. Amen. We don't get to pick and choose from these two things. We have to always preach heavily against every sin in your life and heavily towards the grace and mercy of God in your life. We want, to, we want you to experience the love and grace of God and then move into obedience with Jesus. And listen, you've got to get those in order because if you don't get in Jesus first, you're never going to move into obedience because you're not going to get into obedience with God outside of God. 
Amen. It's, one of the, it's one of the beautiful things about baptism. Every time we baptize somebody, we go through the same process. We sit down with them and we go, listen, we're up here. What I need you to understand as you're getting baptized is I sit down with them. Wes sits down with them. And we go, this is what the Bible says, that, that we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. And here's what that means. That means that our job with your life, your job with your life, God's desire in your life is that you would stretch your life out across the word of God and then become obedient in every single area of it. Amen. That doesn't mean that you go, ah, oh, God's out of date here. God's not culturally relevant here. That doesn't stand up any, wrong, any longer. Wrong! We are in full obedience to the word and the will of of God. And that's not because God is being petty and wants to pick on us. It's because God wants the best for us. And sometimes, just like children, we discipline our children because we know it's what's best for them. Listen, I just took my two uh, foster children. We had to go to the 30 day checkups this last week. And as we were doing it, one kid had to get two shots in each leg and then have blood drawn from the arm, the other one had three shots. Uh, two in one leg, one in the other, and they got a thing from the arm. Those kids looked at us like we had betrayed them. But we did what was best for them, even though in the moment it was painful. We cannot afford to, to stick our finger up into the wind of culture, see which way culture is blowing, and then bend our life to that. We must always align our life with the word of God in every single area. And that's our role as a church. That's our, my role as your pastor is to help us line up. Because if not, what we're doing is we're equipping sheep to wander off and be destroyed. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little off on something else there. Here we go. So, how does a sheep get found? Man, I love this. Have you ever lost, like, I, I, don't, I don't know how many of you guys are really big losers, and that, that probably came off wrong. Um, I lose stuff a lot. In particular, I lose, ca lose cash. Like, I don't, I don't carry a lot of cash, so I tend to lose cash if I carry it. And so I, I, like, I tend to, I want to deposit everything in the bank, because, man, I'm horrible about hanging on to paper money. It's just not a gift that I have. Uh, and, but when it goes missing, here's what I do. Uh, the kids stole it. <laughs> Absolutely, the kids stole it, or or Crystal's got it. But let's be honest, she's got all of it all the time. And so, like, like, but it's always like it's always somebody else's fault. And when when I lose it, it's always to, I'm always going to blame somebody else first. And you know where I always find it? In the pants I was wearing. Probably in the I've laundered more money. That's not a good sense to say. Uh, <laughs> I have physically washed with soap and water more money than, listen, I, listen I have, I've been alive for 43 years. I've spent 31 of them looking for cash that has been misplaced in my home. It is a thing that I've done. Now, if you're a really good loser like I am, um, you know that you usually blame somebody else. But here's the thing. What I always find out is that I'm the one that took my money. Like, like I'm responsible for it being lost. In this story of the sheep and the shepherd, the shepherd didn't lose the sheep. God didn't lose you. And yet, he takes responsibility for the disqualified. And the shepherd leaves the sheep to go, I love that's my favorite, to go after. That's our God. To go after. And listen, we get found when, you're taking notes, you can write this down. We get found when we start looking for the God who's already looking for us. God is looking for you. God invaded history to come and step into your life because, listen, we've lost ourselves. We see, we tend to exclude and disqualify. Many of you, like a lot of you guys, when you look at the story of the of the two sons, you go, oh, or, or, I'm sorry, when you hear the, the, the story of the, the four types of people I described, a lot of us, if we're being honest, we're the people who tend to exclude and disqualify. But that's not who God is. God doesn't exclude and disqualify. God leaves and looks for the 99. Or for the one. He leaves the 99 to look for the one. And when he finds it, I love this, he lifts it up on his shoulders. It, it's, they, they do, it's called a fireman's carry. What you do is constrain the sheep so it can't move. It's the same thing that a fireman does when they rescue someone from a fire. Is they put you around their shoulders in such a way where they can restrain your movement. 
Because in that moment, what they're trying to do is save you. And some of your instincts actually put you more in danger. And so they restrain you. They discipline you. They, they, they hold you in a way that maybe is even uncomfortable. But it's so that they can carry you to safety. And I love that in this story. It's so huge. Listen, God doesn't jump up and get on our back. God puts us on his shoulders. That's God. Let him lift you up. Because then, once you're lifted up and you're constrained by God, you can begin to be strong and you can have joy that you've never had. And you can be some, become someone that God uses to carry other people out of danger. If you have children, you know that children fall into one of two types when they're little. They're either barnacles or runners. <laughs> They either attach to you or they take off on you. Okay? Now, I, Zach was born. We had a barnacle. Oh, God love him. He just was there with us all the time. We never worried about Zach. But Caitlin, mm -mm. we were not prepared for Caitlin. If my daughter is the, the young lady who is, is aging way too quickly down on this end of the stage. It's saying with us earlier, she makes me nervous. I, and I have this weird desire to kill every teenage boy. It's a strange thing to happen. And so, like, like it, it's, it's a thing that goes on. So, but in that, and looking at her, she was a runner. And so I'll never forget going, we went, we were at Sears. And, and my daughter, I, I, I kind of referenced the story a little bit last week. I'll tell you the whole story this time. So Caitlin was always like to hide and run. And so Caitlin was, was a hider. She was, she was a runner. And so I remember one time I was trying to find her. I was really nervous. And then finally I saw her, but she didn't see me. And now what happened was we were doing the summer and a lot of guys my age tend to wear a certain uniform, t-shirt, khaki shorts, flip flops. Well, there happened to be another guy that was walking away from her that was wearing flip flops, khaki shorts, and a t-shirt very similar to the color that I was wearing. And I watched her head off towards him. And she ran up and she grabbed his hand from behind because she was worried she was going to get away from dad. And the guy turns and looks at her. And I, try, and, and, and you would think as a good father, I would have stopped this from happening. I'm not always a good dad. Like, I go, she's like, oh, she'll learn a lesson. Nah, ha, ha. And so I'm going to grab onto a stranger just for a moment. And so the guy turned and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. I'm not your dad. And the look on her face was utter shock. And then I ran in and she goes, you and she had such relief and I said baby listen whether you know it or not you were never out of my sight I had you the whole time and what God is saying in the story of the sheep is he said you listen you've never left my sight he is nearer than you will ever realize because God loves the disqualified he loves the collaborator and when he finds them he celebrates and then, he's going to move into another story. And so I want you to listen to story two. Go ahead. Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found the silver coin I lost. I tell you, in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So you had sheep who wandered off following his stomach, and now you've got a coin. But guess what? A coin's not going to wander off. Uh, listen, uh, how does a coin get lost? Like, it's not like a sheep. I mean, that coin wasn't in this woman's purse. And then all of a sudden she was like, I'm going to the store to buy toilet paper. And that coin didn't go. That's not what I'm destined for. And then rolled out of her purse and went to Vegas to make something happen. Like, that's not what happens here. The coin is an inanimate object. So how does a coin get lost? That coin fell through somebody's hands. That coin slipped through someone's fingers. There's a, there's a show that I used to watch as a kid. Some of you guys have watched it. Matter of fact, I'm going to do a quick test. I know a little bit older crowd at 8 o'clock, but I just want to do an evaluation. I want to play you a theme song. It's one of my favorite shows growing up. If you know it, sing along for a minute. Go ahead. I'm going to put you up against the other services, so get ready. Now this is a story all about it. My life got flipped, turned upside down. Oh, come on, bring it out. Just sit right there. I'll tell you how I became the 
friends of a town called Bel Air. All right, stop for a second. That was so cool. Everybody except Mimo and Peepaw were rock. Okay. Like, <laughs> Like, Bebo's back there going, what show is this? Man, I, I used to watch The Fresh Prince all the time, and I'll never forget this episode. As long as I live, when Will, who has left home at an early age, hadn't met his father, um, was not connected to his dad his whole life, and then all of a sudden his dad shows up, but his dad doesn't stick around. And he had, for me as a, as a young boy, one of the most gut-wrenching sitcom episodes I'd ever seen that culminated in this. Daddy O! What's up? Will, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um, some business came up I gotta handle. So we're gonna have to put a, our trip on hold. You understand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's cool. That's cool. Just, just for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little longer. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Look, I'll, I'll call you next week and we'll iron out the details, okay? Yeah, yeah. It was great seeing you, son. You too, Lou. Yeah. Yeah, um... I'm sorry, Will. You know what, actually, this works out better for me. You know, the Slimmies of Summer come to class wearing next to nothing, you know what I'm well, saying? Well, it's all right to be angry. Hey, well, why should I be mad? I'm saying, at least he said goodbye this time. I just wish I hadn't wasted my money buying this stupid present. I'm sorry. I, you know, if there was something that I could Hey, you do... know what? You ain't got to do no, nothing, Uncle Phil. Hey, you know, ain't like I'm still five years old, you know? Ain't like I'm going to be sitting up every night asking my mom, when's daddy coming home, you know? Who needs him? Hey, he wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first basket, but I learned, didn't I, yeah, Uncle Phil? Did. Got through my first day without him, right? Mm -hmm. I learned how to drive. I learned how to shave. I learned how to fight without him. I had 14 great birthdays without him. I ain't need him then, and I don't need him now. Will. Will. Now, you know what, Uncle Phil? I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. I'm going to marry me a beautiful honey, and I'm going to have me a whole bunch of kids. I'm going to be a better father than he ever was. And I sure as hell don't need him for that, because that thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids. How come you don't want me, man? How come you don't want me, man? Yeah. Jesus in the story of the sheep and the coin, he's not minimizing the value of one of these lost things. He is maximizing the value of this one lost thing. Can I just tell you that we live in a world... <laughs> in the U.S. right now, there are 438,000 foster children. These are children without permanent families. In 2017, 23,000 foster kids aged out of foster care with no emotional or financial support at all. Within six months, more than 40% of them will be homeless or couch surfing home to home. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe someone was careless with you and you slipped through their fingers and you hit the ground with a thud, and you're still rolling. Maybe it was your parents, maybe it was the church, maybe it was a spouse, maybe you looked at somebody at one point and said, I do, but they didn't mean it when they said it back. And I gotta tell you, for me, one of the things that drew me to Crossroads from the very beginning was the fact that we love students and children here. Man, we, when our church couldn't afford to have almost any staff, the first staff we hired was somebody to deal and be with students. And then we went right after kids because, man, it is so important because we want to look at them. And I'm not saying that we're going to get this right every time, but our desire is to look at every one of them and say, you may have slipped through somebody else's fingers, but you will not slip through ours. One of my favorite pastors, he always says this, if you win the kids, you win. 
Most kids before the age of eight years old will make a decision about how they're going to live their life. And from zero to 18, more than 85% of people who will come to a knowledge of the grace of Jesus Christ do so. We've got to be a church that wins the kids. We've got to be a church that grabs a hold of the people that is, they're slipping through other people's hands. And I want you to look at this. That's how a coin gets lost. But how does a coin get found? First of all, I think we can't miss this. Where did the coin get lost? It got lost in her house. Do you understand what that means? Then for us in the context of the church, you might attend Crossroads every single week, go to a connect group every single week. Maybe you had stars on a chart when you were a kid in Sunday school class week after week after week. You can do all that and still be lost. Amen. But here's what happens if you want to find a coin. And I'll write this down in your, mess, in your notes. <coughs> I love this. When someone's hand opens up, someone else's heart gets activated. So all of a sudden the coin is lost and this woman, she goes into rescue mode. You check this out, man. She <clears throat> searches. Now some people have asked the question, why sent 10 silver coins? Is there significance to that? I'll tell you, I think there's two possibilities to why that's incredibly significant. One, these families lived hand to mouth. And so losing one coin, a drug mart, that is a day's wage. That means that my family, there's a day my family will not eat. It's not, an, it's not like you losing a penny at your house. It is, a, it is a significant thing. And they don't have bank accounts with extra money stored up. It means my family goes hungry a day. But a, a, but a far more probable explanation of why 10 silver coins is this. See, in those days, the Middle Eastern women had a, a, a thing in their culture that they would constantly do. They would, from the time they were little bitty, they would save up to get 10 silver drachmas. And then they would put them on a chain. And the day they were married, they would hang them around their heads. And you had 10 silver coins that in their culture declared their value as a married woman. So losing one of those is like you losing your wedding ring. It has such significance to her. This isn't just a coin. It is deeper. It is more valuable. It is more sentimental than her than we could imagine. And so she tears her house apart because, listen, something that she loves is lost. And so she goes to extreme measures to find it. What an incredible picture of Jesus that is. And let me tell you, this offended the Pharisees. Of all these stories, this probably was the most offensive. Because here's the way a Pharisee's mind work. That you as a sinner are this horrible person. And the idea of you repenting of that sin, getting on your hands and knees, and crawling to an almighty God to plead for your forgiveness, to beg for his mercy on your soul was a way that they interpreted God. But in this story, Jesus actually says that God got on his knees and started looking for you. Amen. And that rocked them. It would have offended them to think that the God of the universe would get on his hands and feet and come looking for us. And yet that's exactly why Jesus went to the cross. Boy, when she finds it, she celebrates. She goes crazy because she was not ready to lose something of such value. God is not really, Why do you think we do ministry in Africa? Why do you think we do ministry in India? Why do you think we push, uh, and we've got new ministries towards foster uh, and adoptive parents, and we've got uh, ministries to prisons? Because God is not ready to consider those coins lost. And so we as his church get on our hands and knees with our father, and we go searching for lost coins. I gotta tell you, that's messy. It'd be way easier if all you were good people in here. <laughs> you know what? A church can be, for a lot of people, a hospital. I don't know. We show up to hospital two different ways, by the way. Sometimes we make an appointment, and you know you're going to have a, a checkup, so you, you put on clean underwear, and you do all the right stuff, and you go because mama told you that's how you're supposed to go to deal with people like the doctor or just in case you have a car crash or whatever. <laughs> but if you know you're going, you prepare a certain way. If you go to the ER, you woke up that morning, you had no idea you were going to end up in that place. 
And I got to tell you, we get in our church some people who come in because they plan to. We get most of our people because they came in through an ER. The other thing that churches get compared to all the time is a hotel. It's a place where you can come and relax and be comfortable. And I got to tell you, if that's what you're looking for, you should probably try another church. Because we're not a hotel. In a hotel, you know what you do? When you, when you get done with your towels in the bathroom, you know what you do? You throw them on the floor. When you get, when you're done eating something, you may or may not throw it in the trash can. And you look at that and you go, eh, I ain't got to do that laundry. I ain't got to deal with that mess. I ain't got to deal with that mess over there. Man, I'm, I'm checking out. They got people that handle this. Um, this isn't a hotel. This is a place we would rather feel more like a home. Which means that if you see a pile of dirty laundry somewhere, guess whose responsibility it is for you to start doing some laundry? Yours. We get busy doing the work of God to clean up the mess. We want to be more like a home than a hotel. We want to be a place where people know your name. We want to be a place where if you don't show up, and this, this doesn't happen perfectly here, but it needs to happen more to where when you aren't here, someone notices. When you're not here, it's recognized. When my, listen, if my son doesn't show up at my house at the right time, I am blowing that dude's phone up. You know why? Because it matters to me that I know where he is. And so we need to do that here. We get found, and then God pardons. And then there's a third story, and i got to go real quick. I'm not going to read you this story. We're going to get into this over the next six weeks, but I want you to hear this. Jesus throws a knockout punch <coughs> as he goes into the parable of the two sons. And what he's going to do is he's going to challenge everything you believe about people and about sin and about lostness and about God. See, the younger son in this story that we've all heard, and his sin is very obvious. And if you want to know what sin is, I'm going to give you an interesting definition if you could write this down. Sin is the greatest feeling that you will ever have that always leads to your destruction. It may feel wonderful. It will end horrifically. Sin will leave you for dead every time. We cannot ever risk minimizing sin in our life. What we need to do is we need to elevate every sin in Scripture and bring our, our lives into accountability with it. That's what we need to do. You'll see more why in a few weeks. But the younger son, his sin is obvious. And then you have the father, the searcher, the rescuer. <clears throat> God is called the Savior of the world for a reason. Do you have any idea what that reason is? Because He is the Savior of the world. Do you know what the word Savior means in the Greek? <coughs> Savior! It means that. Because there's only one definition and there's only <coughs> one person. And so in this story, when you get into it, man, you have a father that searches, a father that runs, a father that gets <coughs> down and dirty with down dirty people to rescue them and lift them out of their dirt into a place where they are holy and set apart and righteous. Man, I'll, I'll never forget when Zach was born, we had a C-section we were not expecting. And, and man, he came out and looked like he was covered in queso. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever experienced in my life. And they, had, they looked at my child, they, they held my child, my cheese covered child, and they looked at him and they, they held him to me and they said, Do you want to kiss him? And my response was, Clean him up first. God doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to kiss them just like they are, I'm going to reach them just like they are. And then he gets excited and he parties. Let me tell you what, when you get to the end of that parable, if you could plug headphones into the word of God, it would be one of the loudest chapters in scripture. It'd be the place where the mute, listen, they're doing the whole watch me whip and nay nay and the YMCA and all that. They're doing the Cupid shuffle and they are getting everything going. And then you have the elder brother that shows up in the story and he hears the music and everybody else is rejoicing, but he's angry. And then the story ends. And I don't know about you, but I hate depressing endings. I was one of the few people when the first three Star Wars movies came out, I could not stand The Empire Strikes Back. Because it ends with the bad guys winning. And I'm a, I want the good guys to win, man. That's where I'm at. I love when that happens. So at the end of the story, I'm going, wait, God, what happens? What happens to the elder brother? What's next? And let me just tell you, the reason I'm doing this this way this morning is because these first two stories that we've talked about, those are not independent of that third story. They are going to set up the story of the prodigal sons. 
When you look at them, you're going to see a sheep and you're going to see a coin and you're going to see how these things tie in. And that's what we're going to unpack for the next several weeks. We are going to invest the next six weeks to one question. There's a difference between being lost and feeling lost. When you, when you recognize you're lost, you start to do something about being found because you realize that you're lost. Here's the other problem. If you don't feel lost, you're actually in a more dangerous position because you don't know you're lost. So you're not looking to be found. And so that's exactly what's going to be happening. We're going to invest six weeks for you to ask one question of yourself, no matter how long you've been in church. Are you lost? When I was in college, I'll never forget writing an essay. <laughs> man, I, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but man, I can put some words to paper. I could, really, I could probably say it in two sentences, but they want ten pages. That is no problem for me. <laughs> and I can put some words out there. And so, man, I would put the... I, I did this, man. I was so excited to turn this, this particular assignment in. I was, I was kind of running late. I put it off to the last minute. And I, the night before, man, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, I'm typing away. I'm like, man, this is genius. I handed out. I couldn't wait to get my grade back. My professor starts handing out papers. Man, I look at the front of the page and it literally says, man... Amazing content. And my first thought was, <laughs> I know, I wrote it. <laughs> and then I flipped, and the back page had two words, written in red and circled. It said, wrong assignment. I had put a lot of work and effort into the incorrect assignment that was being asked for. See, the last thing I would ever want for you as a church is that someday you face Jesus. And he looks at you and goes, great content. Wrong assignment. You missed the point. At the end of your life, you're going to be asked two questions. It's the only two questions. It is the single simplest test that's ever been given. And the cool part is during the series, we're going to give you the answers to both questions. And your answer to these two questions will determine everything about where you go from there. And God doesn't want to be ambiguous. God doesn't want to be secret. If he doesn't want to be mysterious, he wants you to have the answers. Because he wants to make sure that at the end of it all, you can say that I did the right assignment. That's what he wants for your life. And for right now, we're stopping right there. <laughs>